Hi, I'm Bob Sweets. I'm the acting director here with UBR Galleries. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's panel discussion, Steaming Fascist and Contemporary Artistic Practice in Rationalist Urban Space. I'd like to thank our exhibition curator, Marion Hayes, for bringing this about to the UBR Galleries and also for organizing tonight's panel discussion. It's been a pleasure working with Marion and bringing this project this very responsive and impactful exhibition to life. It's actually one of the things that I enjoy most about this position and my job here is working with faculty across disciplines and bringing their research into a physical exhibition space for people to enjoy. I'd also like to thank our panelists, including several artists in the exhibition who have traveled here from Germany and Italy to join some of our UB faculty here in conversation tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge the UB College of Arts and Sciences and the Buffalo Philharmonic Kurt Weill Collaboration Project for supporting photographic recall and tonight's panel discussion. I'd now like to introduce Brown McKeenan, Director of Arts Collaboratory, who would like to say a few words. Thank you.
free market, <laughs> to say the least. Um, so, coincidentally, a number of academic publications feature the title Staging Fascism as well and address the role of exhibitions in Mussolini's propaganda machinery. One author, Marla Stone, looks at the exhibition of the fascist revolution, which took place in 1932, at the 10th anniversary of the fascist as assumption of power. She concludes that, quote, the dictatorship discovered an exhibition formula mixing avant-garde aesthetics with commercial tourism and the rhetoric of national culture, which catered to a wide range of cultural tastes. Fascism had turned its act of self-representation into a natural, national spectacle. This panel is interested in both the dynamic of the exhibition that surrounds us here and the meaning of the artworks to display it. The national spectacle that powerfully enlisted mass support in 1932 reverberates in today's architectural rem remnants of that regime and its effects and lure are still palpable in the stories told in the photographic and video works in this exhibition. These works exude some of that spectacular vibrancy that was built into its conceptualization, use of materials, and spatial arrangement. We are looking here at the select works of six Germans and one Italian, which triggers a set of specific and unique questions. However, these questions are not essentially German or Italian, but they rather pose the question how the medium was employed to define what the notion of German and Italian might mean. So how are we to understand these contemporary artworks? Are they primarily objects of aesthetic appeal, objects of art with a capital A? Or are they rather forms of social and political critique stemming from an individual subjectivity, political consciousness, or a collective memory narrative? How are they presented here or elsewhere? What constitutes a work of art given the fact that most works in that show seem to come in series or sets or pairs? How does the moving image of video complicate our observations about the function of it and effects of still photographs and vice versa? How in sum do we determine these works and meanings? With this admittedly enormous question, we enter the territory of aesthetics and philosophy of art, and I don't intend to pursue this issue in depth here. Raising these questions, however, means to ask about the role of artistic practice and its function today, a question underpinning our discussion as a whole. Their shared subject matter, architecture of the 1920s to 40s, which was designed and built while Italy was under a fascist regime, adds a second layer of complexity to the question of how to determine these words meaning. The German urban historian Harald Bodenschatz has eloquently put into a comparative German-Italian perspective the two countries' respective post-war ass assessments of Nazi and nationalist architecture. In contrast to Germany, with its fundamentally disturbed relationship to the material legacy of the Nazi past, Bodenschatz points out, a cautious process of cultural revision began in Italy in the 1960s. This happened irrespective of the widespread ritual condemnation of fascist and of man. By the 1980s, a number of important exhibitions in Italy fortified this revisionist assessment. Today, a certain enthusiasm for the architecture and urban plan of the Mussolini regime can be seen in the Italian specialist discourse, which, however, above all focuses on the aesthetic qualities of these plans and re realized buildings, but which operates outside of political and sociological categories. This, of course, falls short of a comprehensive critical analysis. In addition, most of the fascist urban and architectural heritage is hardly ever con con consciously registered as such by the Italian population and by most foreign visitors. Apart from 
from some spectacular large-scale projects, this architecture is also rarely associated directly with Mussolini. However, the past decades or so has shown a marked shift in practice and scholarly debate that places Italian architecture of the Mussolini years up for discussion as problematic or difficult heritage uh, or a subject of critical artistic discourse. And I argue that these exhibition pieces here are doing just that, or they're trying to do that. So the question, what is fascist about these, this architecture, points at a final important track of thought tonight. Several decades of comparative research and contentious debates on the definability of and a conclusive definition of fascism have produced at least an agreement that fascism can be defined based on particular ideological traits. Fascism, in the interpretation of Robert Roger Griffin, can be defined as, quote, a generous, a genus of modern revolutionary mass politics, which, while extremely heterogeneous in its social support and in the specific ideology promoted by its many permutations, draws its internal cohesion and driving force from a core myth that a period of perceived national decline and decadence is giving way to one of rebirth and renewal in a post liberal new order, quote end. The panelists here are highly qualified to tackle such questions as they explore through artistic and architectural work and scholarly pursuits, different critical uses of visual media and historic and contemporary claims for urban and architectural space. So I'm going to introduce them one after another, or like all of them right now, and then they will present. First, the three artists uh, will present, um, and then the three scholars, uh, and then we will all convene to this table here, um, start the conversation amongst ourselves, and then you will be invited to, uh, to also ask questions and to join into the conversation. So the first, um, presenter uh, today is going to be Michael Flimberg. Um, he has explored Italian rationalist space since 2010 when he received a Casa Valli fellowship in Rome, which is a German government funded fellowship, three months fellowship. He works with text, photography, and video, engaging the leftovers of the everyday, be it neoclassical columns and capitals or paper and coin hunter configuration at our currency. Some recent photo book publications of his are Future History, a different configuration of which is exhibited here, and I have a, a copy of this book here for you to look at. Um, and another book is Rückschaufehler. Um, both books were published in 2013, and this later book is, is um, concerned with the reconstruction of Berlin City Castle. Some of you might have followed this uh, ongoing debate about the reconstruction of the Berlin City Castle and replacing, uh, replacing a, a modernist building. His work has been exhibited at Württembergischer Kunstverein Stuttgart, the EZ Bank Frankfurt, Skoll Gallery in Hanover, Haus 1, America Gallery, Berlin, Grünberg, who lives, in, who lives and works in Berlin, Germany. Um, our second speaker is Katharina Morelli. The author of the 1984 video, The Day, in this exhibition, over uh, there, behind the curtain. Um, she has worked in radio, television, and independent film since the early 1980s. Her work includes a wide range of genres, experimental video, documentaries, and in-depth news coverage. The 2008 documentary film, Asmara Eritrea, followed inhabitants of the Eritrean capital on tours through the city. Her most recent documentary about her now 96-year-old father, the house he built, is a multi-layered reflection of memory and vision. In addition to many festivals and screenings internationally, her work has been shown at the Museum of Modern Art, the Pacific Film Archive, the American Museum of the Movie Image, and the British Museum. Gray is a graduate of the 1987-88 Whitney Museum of American Art Independent Studies Program, Art Studio, already lives in Rome and in New York 
Seeley. Heidi Schrecker has been showing her work since 1989 in numerous solo exhibitions, most recently at Pinacoteca Modern in Munich, 2015, Berlin Schiffelerie in Berlin, 2016, and at, uh, most recently uh, her first um, comprehensive monographic show, solo show, at the Kunstmuseum Bonn in 2018. In 2010, Schrecker received a fellowship for the Villa Massimo in Rome, also a German government funded program that's a one year program. While there, uh, the project Termini, and most of the pieces in here are part of this project, um, was conceived. Schrecker has received numerous awards for her work, such as the European Photography Award and the Working Grant from Kunst von Bonn. She is Professor of Photography at the Academy of Visual Arts in Leipzig and lives in Leipzig, Berlin, and Leipzig. In his photo-based work, John Opera, um, faculty member of the art department here at UB, combines a deep interest in the visual characteristic of natural and scientific phenomena with a rigorous experimental approach to the techniques and apparatuses by which photo photographs have been defined and produced. Opera often returns to antiquated but not but by no means exhaustive photographic tools and processes, including pinball imaging and more recently the cyanotype and antitype. He lived, worked, taught, and exhibited in Chicago for more than a dozen years under the John D. Ruby faculty in 2018. Charles Davis, the second academic research, examines the integration of race and style theory in modern architectural debates from the late 19th to the mid 20th century. He has published articles and essays in important architecture historical journals, such as the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians, Harvard Design Magazine, and Aggregate. His design work, which examines the contemporary relevance of his academic research, has been exhibited at galleries in New York State and in North Carolina. Charles is co-editor of the cultural reader Diversity and Design, Understanding Hidden Consequences, 1915, and the forthcoming Race and Modern Architecture, University of Pittsburgh. Davis is an assistant professor of architectural history and criticism at the University of Buffalo. And last but not least, Camilo Trumper, first book, Ephemeral uh, Histories, Public Art, Politics, and the Struggle for the Street in Chile, 2016, is a cultural history of political change in late 20th century Chile. Ephemeral histories is a study of the myriad ways in which traditional marginalized individuals claim city spaces as a means of entering into political things. The second project is one of ephemeral history's most compelling subplots regarding urban politics and democracy and dictatorship a pivots to explore childhood schooling and activism in Pinochet's children. Trumper is Associate Professor of History at UB. And I would like you to um, very, very warmly, help me very warmly on my
and to Rome, which is in the next one, yes. Um, my project deals with architecture as a visual representation of the fascist regime. You need to know that Italian Italy experienced the construction boom during the late 20s and 30s and 20th century. The whole country was newly furnished. Housing, transportation, and countless buildings of the different party organizations have been built. So I want to give you a closer look at one of those party organization buildings that you see here. It's a building in Rome. The next one, please. This is the entrance. Um, you can see it, this inscription uh, on top of the former speaker's balcony. It reads, it's important to win, but even more important to fight. <laughs> Since this building was a building of the fascist youth organization, you can take it as an uh, Olympic thing, uh, meaning, okay, taking part is everything. So it's in core, a hardcore fascist slogan that fighting for itself is a value and uh, it's a purpose in itself. So. On the next slide, you see the Olympic <coughs> Tower, the so called Tower and Tourism, and you can read the name of the youth organization, which is called Juventus Italiana del Torino, GIL. Today, uh, to the famous referral is ex Jill. It's a sports center and exhibition hall. And under, underneath, there's an A15, Arno Critici, which means it's the 15 years of the new fascist calendar, which starts in 1922. And it's called Arno Critici Era Fascista. It means 1937. So the building was completed in 1937, and it's all still there. But, the next slide, please. This is a period photograph, I guess, late 30s. The main office's room. We got in the same town uh, an antique architectural reference. The you see the oculus on the ceiling, the first Pantheon building in Rome, and at the same time you got this modern uh, steel chairs uh, from the table. And you see in the back uh, a large map of Africa and open windows. And compared to the next slide, you can see that the map is still there, but the building is completely out. So the modern quality of the building has been erased partly, and the colonial dream of the Italian Empire is still there. So you have Libya as a colony and Ethiopia, and the rest is uh, already <laughs> colonized. And you got the date on top, it's the May 9 in year 14, 19. So it's six. Then Mussolini announced the victory over Abyssinia after the war and declared the new Roman Empire. <coughs> and that's a specific historical moment when the so-called Steven Torino, the fascist style, became a mandatory architectural style in the modern part of that history seem to be over. <coughs> the large M, the capital M, is for Mussolini and is a reference to Napoleon, which has this capital M as a signature. <coughs> On the next slide, uh, not from another perspective. And this is the connection to the next sheet which are photographs I took in Asmata, Eritrea, the former colony of Eritrea. And it's 
somehow a cynical dialectic term that Italian architects found in the new colonies a playground for the futuristic and modernist ideas. So you have here this train-like building running down the road, or this modern-style hotel building over there. The price for that has been paid by the native inhabitants who were expelled from the inner city. Thank you. together. So there was a kind of blindness, in a way. 
The distance that I acquired living abroad allowed me for the first time to look at places I was blind to and I to engage with them. And uh, I discovered that there were many things I was interested in. In uh, my new acquired site, uh, show me a whole range of places, ever that, either that I already identified as fascist, or uh, such as for Italico, or that previously for me went unnoticed, uh, i.e., they didn't, uh, yeah, they were not labeled in my experience as fascist. And this is like, for example, the university compound in Rome, La, La Sapienza. This for me was not a fascist place. It was a place where you, you went to have, um, to talk, to have assembly, to have demonstrations. So, so it was uh, all another experience. Or, uh, and it's the next, uh, these are the example, this is a Florence train station. It is an amazing place, really beautiful. Or La Triennale in Milan, and these are places where Sven Carmenti were done in Rome, so where the fascists open a um, demolished building to open either uh, to undermine the archaeology, Roman archaeology sites, or to open um, connection between neighbors, like this one, Corso di Nascimento. So, I guess I started uh, seeing the buildings from the city intervention for what they were in terms of architecture and of urban planning. And I felt comfortable in these environments. I, I, I started appreciating even uh, previously forbidden places like uh, the Palazzo della Civiltà uh, del Lavoro, the Square Colosseum. <coughs> Um, so, as uh, I have mentioned before, as, uh, uh, you have to understand the context of this is that during fascism a lot of buildings were built, a lot of infrastructure was put in place. So even the road maintenance building are built in this period, the electrical exchanges, so the post office, the schools, you know, so 80% of those buildings were built in, the, in that period. So, those buildings that are utilitarian passed under the radar. They were not perceived as fascist. So, not everything built under the fascist reg regime is perceived as fascist. So, what is fascist? What makes a fascist building? And what, make, what is fascist about the building? And so, these are my three different experiences, if you want. Something that I understand as fascist and something that in my experience was fascist, but is a building from the turn of the 19th century and uh, La Sapienza University at least evidently was built in that period, but I didn't perceive as fascist. So, um, I guess certain buildings or places of that period mostly was built by the party or to commemorate or represent the party's ideology are more identifiable for the period and the regime. And for Italico, would certainly fit under that definition as we saw before uh, with the Dune. Uh, that's what for Italico is. <laughs> And um, so, but I bet, we can go on waiting for the picture, but I bet that in contemporary uh, Italian uh, people experience, for Italian is not remembered for that association, but is remembered as a sports complex. And most of all is remembered for the soccer stadium. And most of all is remembered for the riots before or after the soccer games. Or for me, is remember because as a kid I went to train on the pool. Or for gay people, as a cruising spot. Uh, for example, Stadio de Mani, where I shot, was a, in the 70s, was a cruising spot. So, um, and I would like uh, uh, to go to um, this other film I made, uh, <coughs> that is titled As Mario Andrea, and I found that we like all of them, like work that uh, um, I shot in 2004 and uh, in the film as marinos from different walks of life guide me through the streets of their city and bring me to places of their choice in doing so and the next slide so you have an idea in doing so and by talking about their own asmara each person locates personal memories in public spaces 
invest in the urban environment with individual meetings. So this is an example of like, this guy brings me to this place where he used to go to smoke as a kid and he tells me why and then he talks to me about uh, he tells me about his experience like why he left the nation, why he went underground uh, to join the, the war of independence. This woman bring me to her home because that's where um, they were born and her mother and their mothers, you know, so that was their defining place and so on. And um, uh, through this people narration I composed beyond the city the national history from the turn of the 19th century to today, a long history of colonization from the Abyssinian Empire to the end of the bloody 30 years war of independence with Ethiopia. Filming, I realized that the individual's narration revealed people's capacity to look at past and often traumatic events and repossess them as part of their collective history. A building that for me, and this is the next slide, represented uh, Italian fascism. This is an F. If you read it, it's an F for fascism. Oh, this is the party's headquarters, and this is the, the, the place in case Mussolini would visit. This was the place where he would speak. So, for me, this is a fascist building. Okay? I mean, it's built for a certain reason. For us, Marino had already acquired a collective function that emptied it of its colonial symbolism. And this is the Minister of Education. So nobody referred to it as uh, you know, a, a building built during the regime. The process of the field made me realize that in, the, in an urban environment, uh, buildings and places are not frozen in time. I learned to see architecture as fluid. Its meaning in public consciousness changes upon the use. It depends on, upon people's experience. So it is not the architecture that carries the symbolic meaning in my experience, but the always changing experience that people associate to architecture. Therefore, lately my reflection has brought me to think that, this, um, that it is uh, not architecture that still carry an untouched ideology, but the current ideology is being untouched to architecture to revive, and if not a, if not a fascist, but definitely a populist movement, as we are experiencing now in Italy. After the fall of Mussolini in March 1943 and the civil war of resistance, there wasn't really a process of reconciliation in Italian society. The uh, society just went on. Former fascists just declared them uh, to be democratic, and that was it. And uh, in historian work, historians work, you often um, see quoted people, like interview by uh, people, where they say, we were talking about this transition, they say we saw fascist militants, uh, squadristi, the people that would uh, beat people up, so really militants, turn overnight against the regime. They now go around as nothing happened. So I'm afraid Italian society has not done a full nuanced discussion and elaboration of what had happened and everything that that implied. And I underline in this uh, the colonial enterprise that is really something we haven't dealt with and that is resounding in all this immigrant crisis that we have now. So um, part of what is happening now I think is the result of the fact that we didn't do this. And to conclude, um, these are some work uh, of art that I think are interesting. I think it is the nature of the artist to offer a different look of, on things, a different way of, of seeing that can open up a dialogue and create historical and critical connection. Sometimes a small gesture can provoke pro pro turmoil, earthquake of the meaning. And this is a piece that was done, I think, a couple of years ago in Bolzano, and is uh, um, uh, they just overlay this um, Anna Arendt phrase on the building, and it's totally like uh, I think it, uh, underneath the, the bar leaf, so this is Mussolini 
very different since we be placed strong in terms of this ideology concept. So just something so simple as overlaying something over um, the next slide. This is Tripoli. And what I saw in Tripoli that really started me, this is in 2004, I think, in this picture, is that uh, I was going around the group, uh, um, I was working on, on I was just shot in Asmar, I think. So I was looking at the architecture, and uh, I realized that certain people I didn't recognize as being built in that period because they were painted green. Because green is the color for Islam, Islamists. And so really, it took nothing, just a, a, a coat of paint to really create the distance. Now, these images are not great because only show like decoration, you know, but. Or, uh, and this is my last uh, picture, this is something that I thought was super effective. This is uh, a street name for a square in Toulouse. And uh, I wish, this is wrong, it's 1852. I wish they had continued and didn't stop in 1852, but you know, to, like, things go on and, and, and places change meaning. I mean, if you see what a difference you can imagine from electoral to what they wrong. I mean, to the king of Rome, there is something happened there. So, um, to conclude, one of the questions we had to prepare for this panel was are you complicit, apolitical, or critical, or a combination thereof? Actually, I really believe you cannot be apolitical in anything you do. So, least of all, you are making. And being complicit is a choice. So, as an artist, what is there for you is, I think, is to open in any creative, creative way you know what you're looking at and to expose, contextualize and create connection to allow for critical reading. And then you should let your audience do the rest. <laughs>
these two images are made in the private museum of Giorgio di Chirico. The, on the left side, the whole, the whole work of Termini is about 60 images, and we have, I have only four huge images, like you see over there, the marble and the clock, and the rest are images all the same, small size. And um, these two images is shown on the right side, a couple, a couple, it's called Die uh, Beunruhigten, I only knew it in German, Die Beunruhigten Musen, which means the alarmed muses. So this alarmed person, it's an uh, alter ego for myself, so I'm the alarm, alarmed uh, or nervous person who uh, uh, find herself in a time or in a place or in a situation where she's looking on history. So that's, that's the whole idea of the work. And um, can we go to the next? So here you can see another situation uh, of an exhibition, how I deal with the images. So the idea is like a chain you are wearing, where you have big jewels, <laughs> the main, so the, uh, uh, the icons, perhaps the icons of the of the work, whole work, and the small images are telling more or less the stories. Um, I think the, uh, when you're looking on fascism and thinking about photography and about film, it's a language uh, which means uh, propaganda, and I'm following uh, the opposite uh, language. It's I'm uh, talking visually in kind of anti-propaganda, which means I don't offer answers. I'm uh, questioning things. And my strategy is to question questioning things in the image itself. So uh, can you, uh, so this, for example, is looking on material, you know? so, <laughs> Looking, so you have photography, but you're looking on a flat surface, and um, so it's already like a mirror who's asking the, the, um, the one who's looking on the image, uh, what is this about? So there's, at the first time there's nothing to read, you know, because of the surface. And can you go to the next? This marble, perhaps it's easier to see it on the original, <laughs> because um, when I photographed this piece of uh, marble, which is more or less one to one, uh, I liked the idea of the blind angel. So in the in the upper part of the image, I always saw this, uh, these are the eyes so it's like an angel and I was thinking about this angel from Power Clean and, um, and then on the, on the uh, bottom you, you have on the right on the left side you have marble but on the right side you have a reconstruction of marble it's painted so um, it's both showing the same uh, surface but uh, it means a different content. That's also that's a, it, that's a kind of um, meta. It's a, yeah, it's a kind of visual meta even of of uh, the things I want to deal with. So I'm I'm not explaining everything or explaining. I don't want to show uh, things where you can read uh, anything. Like for example, Eiko when he, when he says in this images you have an M and that, that means Mussolini or you say this is an F, this means fascism. It's more like uh, what what can I see, uh, what thing can I see which is hidden between these two rings. No? It's overwritten history and I think I'm showing the already the overwritten thing, not the I don't want to show it naked, I want to keep it um, hidden. Can we go to the next image? Yeah. So on the left side you have this marble. So marble is produced
used in slices and then you put it on the wall and uh, I think the, the right part was fall apart and then it's easier to make, make the reconstruction by painting. Um, so um, this tower is, is the station, is the tower of the station in Zabaudia and the interesting thing is that in all my images of clocks, the clocks are not working. Or, they, or in photography, you can't see. Of course, it's a document of a clock, but you don't know if the clock was running or not. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, that, that what I mean with the hidden. Uh, I can tell you it was 12 o'clock, but in fact, I did the uh, four images at one o'clock and every clock was running a different time and, uh, and yeah. So it's, it's a metaphor for what time is now or what time do we have or what time was and what time will be. <coughs> I mean, go, um, yeah, this explains already again this, this, this dealing with this icons and uh, a couple of images so I have Diptychons and series, small series. And the next one, so this is, this are, these are lamps I photographed in Turin, where the, um, it's Piazza CLN, it's Committee of uh, Liberation Nationale, so it's a place named for resistance, but you have the same lamps in Eur, where they didn't change anything. And it's um, a photograph of the same lamp, perhaps one second later, with a different uh, lens opening. And there again, we have this metaphor for on off or off on. So, um, um, it's, um, yeah, I don't want to explain everything. And the last image is uh, again, uh, it's from the uh, square Colosseum, and um, it's a, yeah, because I'm working digital, I decided to make a black and white print and a color print, and because we have the black and white print over in the exhibitions always on the left side, we have the imagination or the idea that this image could be older or done earlier than the color image because color photo photography was in, in that it later. Um, to come back to the I, uh, I, I think it's um, because Miriam mentioned that uh, Eiko uh, did this fashion connection, fed this, uh, this um, mm -hmm. is that Colosseum, uh, it's now the it's now the headquarter of Fendi. Mm -hmm. No, but they are advertised. No, it's the headquarter of Fendi. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so it's um, this uh, fascist building is occupied by uh, um, by Fendi, and th that's interesting because in in the art scene, to, uh, what is fascism? What is capitalism? In the art scene, the main uh, artist spots are done by fashion companies now. No? It's, we have Prada in Milano, we have Fendi in Rome. Fendi is the only. Uh, fashion brand who's still working with fur. Fur is also, uh, um, I'm, I'm sure that Mussolini wears fur. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but, um,
uh, especially with a show like this one, the subject obviously complex uh, in nature, we should, I think, consider how the medium functions as much as all of the associations uh, that are attached to presenting the subjects of the semiotics of the play. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that all of the photographers in this show are operating, uh, I think, with a hyper awareness of the medium's limitations, its distortions, its relationship to truth, which is of course, very slippery and always problematic, and of course, its histories. Uh, and uh, contemporary analysis of photography, I think, tends to default to this classical semiotic assumption that the reference for the subject and its representation in the photograph uh, occupy distinctly different spaces. And I, I would like to contend and just reintroduce and maybe suggest that uh, the division between the subject and the representation reference and and its uh, photographic representation, sorry, cannot be so easily separated. And I, I think that's really key uh, to understanding the strategies of play in the show and how, how the subject plays out. So I, I have two points, basically, that are interrelated. Uh, one, I think, is just to touch on the historical precedents that I see echoing throughout this exhibition. Uh, in a way, uh, very typically German, I would say this is, uh, except Ico's uh, work, I think, uh, has a lot of characteristics of American methodologies and strategies. I'll get into that in a second. Um, but I think all the work in this show embody the dead pan, as Charlotte Totten calls it. The strategy is present throughout the show and reinforces, I think, uh, the ambivalence uh, towards the subject, this, this kind of hyper uh, awareness of operating within this program. Uh, and it, of course, for me, uh, starts with the Beckers, Fern and Philip Becker. Uh, and I, I include this because of the H.O. Oates uh, photograph. This, this was a, a piece of architecture, I believe, that was in Buffalo. It's just, I, think it's, I think it's the H.O. Oates that was in Buffalo. Um, but the dead pan, uh, through its coolness, I think avoids the tropes and cliches that are often embedded in photography, though. I think it paradoxically can also embrace them. If you're kind of using this plain language to, uh, to express the subject. And it's closest, I think, uh, we can maybe get to achieving anything around the ideas of objectivity uh, in the photographs, even though that obviously doesn't exist. Um, but, but this kind of style for me points almost to the camera's indifference uh, to the subject, that there really are very little tricks at play here. It's observer apparatus uh, and subject. And so some examples. Um, I, I wanted to also go to the word next time. It's Thomas Wood. Is it Wood? It is to say Ruff. But the reason I'm showing these is Ruth Sport uh, are the large images in the show. And uh, these, I think, are really important to understanding how he has always approached uh, his subject. And in these works, he's suggesting really that photographs are only recordings of surfaces. Uh, I already talked about surface. Um, anyway, well, first of all, go back. I mean, the, the, the scale, go back. Sorry. Um, the scale is important here. Uh, they are super large format, as all of his images typically are shot on the 8x10 film. Uh, so the detail is, is hyper real. Um, so, uh, but in these photographs, uh, they really don't, for, for Ruth, they are all about detail, the hair follicles, the imperfections in one's skin, uh, every kind of little bit of detail that defines the subject. And they really don't show us anything else, according to Ruth. In portraits, especially, uh, within the medium, there's this kind of romantic notion that they're supposed to show us something deep, a uh, deep truth about the person uh, that they're photographing, or something meaningful, meaningful about their personality place in the world. Uh, but these avoid that completely since the idea of depth is only a fantasy uh, to rough um, roof. <laughs> uh, so I think there's a kind of cynicism about this position that's, that's pretty important uh, to consider in terms of how he's always approached subjects, including uh, the ones that are presented here. 
Um, but of course, you know, the world is, is, is filled with symbolism and metaphor, but uh, Ruth is really, I think, uh, again, we're very, very skeptical about what it actually photographed and tells us about the world. So, on to the next one. Um, and so, uh, just some other, other echoes that I, I, I feel are present and, and worth noting. Uh, Icos, uh, marvelously banal, uh, photographs, uh, which uh, very much re remind me, first of all, I, I think out of all of uh, the images in the show, their, their methodology and style, I think, recalls much more of American sensibilities in terms of street photography, Friedlander, uh, we have here, Frank, and uh, Winograd, of course. Uh, but uh, I go with strategies for reminding of, of this body of work by Friedlander uh, of American monuments. And the, the idea here uh, is that history is embedded in the everyday. It's kind of pushed into the background of daily life. Uh, and this includes uh, Civil War uh, monuments that are, are pretty problematic in, in their presence in the South. Um, okay, so ne next slide. <coughs> Oh, not that yet, but okay. And, and, and actually right behind us, uh, Han, Hans Christian's photos, um, I think we call uh, Struth, another German photographer who studied with the Becker, the, this kind of idea that we can have these cities. Um, no, I was, this is Tillman, this is, this is for Johan, sorry. Go back, I don't, I don't have a uh, slide. <laughs> um, but I think Struth is present here, which uh, also for me goes back to Atje uh, and his kind of depictions of people as cities, uh, which you know are rather vanishing in Paris. Um, sorry, I thought you. Um, where am I? Here? Yeah, but that, that's also a strategy uh, that exists throughout the show. In fact, Michael's photographs are the only photographs that contain people, and and, and even with that, uh, there aren't many in there, but they are there. Um, and then. Uh, and Johanna's installation uh, out in the, in the, in the uh, main gallery, uh, which are also analog photographs. Um, so I think there is this, uh, I wouldn't say fetish, uh, she's not fetish on the same medium, but uh, there, there is a, a connection, I think, to older ideas around photography uh, being truthful. And I think the very presence of, of the analog in that context uh, is, is pretty important to how you read that. I might even talk about that in, in more detail. Um, but they recall for me these open catalog kind of constellations uh, of, of Wolfgang Tillman's where there's kind of non, non hierarchical uh, presentation of the subject, almost kind of like a Google search. Um, yeah, and then so on to the next. Oh, wait, not that. Uh, the other, the other thing that, that kind of uh, connects to, to my first point, but uh, I think there, the, and as Heidi uh, uh, explained or, or didn't want to explain, but I'm going to dig a little deeper into I think what you're doing. Uh, but themes that expand the subject uh, of, that's present here into deeper notions of space. In time, and I think that's precisely what Heidi's doing. Uh, like the other artists, she has this kind of cool distance from the subject. Again, I think about uh, an awareness or ultimately a distrust of the medium, but it's also mirrored in her approach to the medium itself, uh, which very much brings to mind basic ontological questions around what uh, what is a photograph? What do photographs do? So, um, thank you. Uh, and I, I think Heidi's pictures in particular, because they are so focused on the medium itself, remind me very much of an essay that I assigned by John Sarkowski, very uh, a key essay, a lot of photo students read it, called Photographer's Eye. And it breaks down the medium into five categories, the thing itself, uh, which only exists really within the photographic universe and not necessarily in the world anymore. Uh, that it's really about being in the container of the picture. Uh, the detail, which drives meaning in the narrative. The frame, which includes or excludes. 
time, which uh, is certainly present in your work, uh, and vantage points, so the single point in space where the photographer stands in relationship to the subject, and I think beautifully illustrated by Heidi rotating around uh, the clock over there in the corner. Um, and then I thought it was curious when I, when I first saw the show, which I've seen it, I think this is my fifth or sixth time now, uh, um, well, I come and have lunch with Bob sometimes. Uh, but I, I thought it curious that the opening images were of the travertine. And I kind of, being the son of a geologist, um, I kept returning to that. And I think their presence is really kind of uh, poetic and, and curious to me. They are both, they're limestone. And limestone direct, uh, directly connects to the fossil record. Uh, so for me, it kind of points to geologic time, deeper notions of cosmic time, as well as uh, deeper senses of time around human position. Again, uh, back to vantage point. Uh, Hans, Hans Christian's work does this too with Roman uh, viaducts. But the quarries where Travertine tra 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 comes from connects back to uh, the Roman, uh, Roman times. And then, of course, I think my favorite piece in the show is, is Heidi's uh, photograph of Carrara Marble. Um, and it, I think, draws attention to how photographs can change perception of the subject. Again, how the subject uh, kind of is, exists within the container of the photograph. Half is real, and half has been rather, I think, unprofessionally uh, recreated by someone. Uh, but I, I think, uh, it, and I, I, I can't believe that you didn't you said you didn't notice that half of it was Trump lawyer was uh, was recreated. But, but uh, for me, this is also a kind of puzzle and question around uh, what the photograph presents to us, and then and then how it actually relates to the subject that exists in the world. Um, so there are there are themes of I think patina, entropy, uh, geologic time registers, but ultimately photographic structure itself, which again I think is, is a really important theme uh, going on here, and maybe one that is uh, distinctly uh, more and more German than, than here, or it's, it's, it's active more in Germany than it, it is in American strategies. Uh, and then finally, uh, it, it, a, lot of, a lot of the kind of patina uh, and uh, effects of time remind me of this, of this photograph by Jeff Wall called Morning Cleaning. Uh, it was taken at the Mies van der Rohe Foundation, which was originally the German pavilion at the International Exposition in Barcelona in 1929, and was recreated in uh, 1999, I think. What Wall has said about this photograph, the purpose of this, and it's a theme that runs throughout his work, this, this idea of cleaning up the world, of maintaining the world, usually uh, modernist structures, but Wallace said that these buildings required an especially scrupulous level of maintenance. Uh, in more traditional spaces, a little dirt and grime is not such a shocking contrast to the whole concept. It can even, it can even become patina. Uh, but as he says, these Mesian buildings resist patina as much as they can. Um, which is how I see some of the ideas playing out here, too, the presence of modernist ruin. Uh, these buildings are, are falling apart. Um, and, uh, and, and as I said, it kind of reminds me of uh, basically the second law of thermal dynamics here. Entropy increases with time. And I think Wall is certainly concerned with how things in the world connect to natural phenomena. But as, as we kind of see in this exhibition, things degrade, they break apart, things go away. Um, and I, I think this can help us frame what we're looking at here, not just in terms of the physicality of architecture, but perhaps hopefully the related ideologies. So, and that's it. Um, and so one of the questions that we were asked to consider for you guys is, 
uh, what makes a fascist building? And I'm an architectural historian, and I think mean, what the show does really masterfully is it, it takes us from this space of looking at the iconic building that is symbolic of a kind of political ideology, but then also showing us the everyday spaces, uh, the spaces of quotidian, ubiquitous life that uh, stretches that span, so that we understand that it's not just the symbolism of the, the buildings that we hold in rotation, but also the everyday reality, the kind of ontological reality of what something is. Um, and so part of me, the part of me that's a historian thought of it in that way the first couple of times when I came to the show. And then the other part of me that's a designer thought of it in a slightly different way. Um, I, I thought about sitting in front of a room of students who were in studio, um, and they want me to tell them what makes a fascist building. How do you make a fascist building? What techniques would you use to construct a fascist building? Um, and what I, what I found was interesting is that, is that there's actually a, a commonality between the strategies, techniques, visual codes, uh, aesthetic traditions with which one makes a fascist building, a democratic building, uh, any kind of political building within a uh, kind of Western tradition. And this is because the Western tradition shares a kind of enlightenment project that is supposedly universal. And this is what I want to talk about, this, this notion of architectural technique being able to make both a fascist building and a democratic building. Because to me, particularly in my work dealing with race, I'm interested in the, the histories and the legacies that technologies of vision, technology of aesthetics inherit. And so too often I think the architect thinks that they're dealing with neutral techniques and strategies. But in actuality, you're dealing with an enlightenment project that comes along with lots of different baggage. And the reason I say all of this is because we're at this supposedly new moment in architectural history, represented by this um, uh, image here, which is an image of a post-digital artifact. Uh, it's post-digital because it tries to reclaim the flatness of the canvas, it tries to reconstruct the sense that this is a, um, an artificially constructed building to see the, the digital apparatus at work. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that uh, on the, the right side, we have Welcome to Famous, and here is uh, Fabulous uh, Beach Athens, but uh, before it was Las Vegas. And so we know that this is a, a quotation of uh, Robert Venturi's work, looking at the American populism of the 1970s. And then we look on the, on the left side, and we see a quotation of uh, an old column with an old lintel system, which uh, fits in the language of Italian rationalism. This idea that the, the Roman Empire is ever present in the, in the current moment. Both are equal forms of populism. Both are equal forms of political ideology coming into architectural work, all using the same technique, revived here today. Now, I can almost guarantee you that the architect who did this did not read this this way. <laughs> because um, uh, today we're, we're interested in this idea of images that are floating, free signifiers that we can put together in any way, shape, or form without any knowledge of history, with historical amnesia present. And I'm here to tell you today that there, this show particularly tells us the danger in that. That if we think that we're dealing with neutral strategy and techniques, we're actually going to repeat the same mistakes of the past. I see this all the time when I look at uh, the um, racial ideologies that continue to reinstate themselves in the present, mostly because we're too lazy to read history and look at history. And now we have a technology that allows us to mix and match images without any kind of knowledge of history whatsoever. And so what this, sh what this show tells me is that there is a, a kind of um, burden that the architect has to hold when they handle techniques, a kind of ethical responsibility that requires them to think about what these histories are and how to handle them properly. And so there is the historic, historiographical story to tell of you know, what was life like under the, the Italian regime, but there's also the disciplinary history to tell. How did one make these buildings? And I would say that they made them in the same way as they made other kinds of architectures, political architectures at the time. Can we go to the next image? Um, one of the uh, signature examples of this, and to show that this kind of um, alternation between uh, fascist and non-fascist goes back and forth, is um, Kashino Fascio by Giuseppe Tarani. Um, here we're looking at it in this context. If we look at the next image, we can see that there's a kind of split uh, story that we tell ourselves. We tell ourselves that, you know, well, you know, there were, there were some bad politics and some bad people at some place in time that have compromised this architecture, but when you look at it for its just neutral, abstract uh, qualities, it, it's a wonderful building. 
fact, it might even teach us something about the present. If you look at the next image, um, we have our text to actually make the story, tell the story. Our Dreisman looks at um, uh, the Castro Fascio on the right uh, as a kind of transparent box, a diagram of a building that tells you how to inhabit it. And so he uses that same technology, that same uh, strategy, same techniques to create his own uh, house too. If we go to the next uh, image, we can also see that that could happen on the other side, using historical fragments to tell a story of the present. Here on the right, there is um, the Roman Interrata project uh, done in the 70s by a group of architects, all taking fragments of uh, um, Rome, Italy, but also mixing them with modernist uh, fragments themselves to show that this project, this humanist project, uh, is continuing present. And uh, those images were reproduced uh, in fragmented form as an excursus to collage city itself. And so whether we want to fetishize history or the geometry itself, the strategies of the Enlightenment project are the strategies of the Enlightenment project. And they can slip into fascism as easily as they can slip into democracy. Now, we're living in a moment where we're starting to see that. Slowly, our democratic institutions are eroding into something that's more authoritarian, something that's more uh, um, fascist in, in its uh, sentiments. Um, and this isn't something that is foreign to our way of life. It's fundamental to the fabric with which we're creating these things. And so um, what, what I struggle with are the kinds of um, knowledges, historical knowledges, but also artistic knowledges that the designer needs to have in order to handle these techniques responsibly in that democratic world. Can we go to the next image? And so what I really like about the show is that it holds visually in tension uh, what I'm trying to struggle with uh, in, in this history of ideas. Um, here we're looking at an uh, image by Hannah Specter, and she, she spoke of it um, at length, but when I look at it with my architect's eye, I notice two things. So the top two thirds of the image um, allows me to sort of um, disconnect myself from reality and look at it as a representation. A beautiful, flat elevation that allows me to understand proportion, um, even the way that one might take a fragment from somewhere else and put it in this image and collage it together. And so there's a collage aesthetic about uh, what is happening in this image. But then the bottom third forces me to be in that place and forces me to understand it as connected to a particular location, a particular point in time. And so the tension for me between those things um, forces me to continue to not only um, blame the political ideologies of the time period for making a fascist architecture, but to also understand how architects and architectural techniques participate in this construction process. If we look at the next thing, what I think is interesting as well is that um, within this language, and this was an image that was also shown earlier, uh, the, the George of Kirchhoff um, uh, reference, is that the rationalism of the line also lends itself to the surreality of a particular situation. Something that is grand, bigger than life, bigger than a person, allows us to both be of a place and to think of something abstracted from that place at the same time something that's transcended beyond that location. And so uh, the tension there that exists uh, is also the tension that I see in the show between the iconic monumentality of what the state was supposed to be, but also the everyday reality uh, of it in its commonplace. We go to the next image. This one I like a lot. Um, this is, um, I want to get the last name right, right? It's Ruth, right? <laughs> I would have been the freshman in your class to say, right. Um, but, but this image I like because um, in the notion of typology, it recalls this idea of a grand um, uh, antique space with a barrel vault with a kind of arcuated presence. But in its actual usage, it's very common in and of itself. And the tension between those two things forces me as the architect to see both the pragmatic function that exists there, but the idealist reference that it is making simultaneously. These are not separate realities. There is no disciplinary history and some uh, cultural history. These are simultaneous, and the architect participates in that with their techniques. So if we look at the next image, um, we, we know that this is the case because there always was a precedent within architectural history. So when I teach my students 
um, and the history of ideas, particularly post-1968, we look at Aldo Rossi's Italian rationalist uh, reinstantiation of uh, space that existed in uh, the state itself. So recalling the past in the present in a kind of commercialized sense, a profane sense, but still uh, borrowing from the dignity of that enlightened uh, and that heightened uh, uh, practice and that heightened uh, reference. And so uh, I appreciate coming to this show uh, for the, the kinds of uh, complexities that it forces me to think about when it comes to how does one make a fascist architecture. And I think that's actually the actual question that I'd like to be asking and talking about uh, when we sort of come to that. Thank you very much. Of, of errancy 
that transformed the margins into a generative site in which a complex, wandering, fluid form of architectural, artistic, and aesthetic practice pushes back against the presumed originality, stability, or universality of a singular Gabbana's model is made more urgent in Latin America by the rise of authoritarian regimes, such as this, uh, the one in Venezuela in the 1950s and in the southern Poland in the 1970s and 80s, which wedded the future-oriented lexicon of modernism and modernity uh, to spatial and material projects of power authoritarian, authoritarianism, spectacle, and terror. That's what I show is I speak more for this. Uh, um, this is uh, Caracas uh, in, in, in the 1950s, which, as historian Elizabeth Blackmar writes, um, the regime connected the forward-looking aesthetics and cutting edge technologies with that to reinforce one fundamental claim, modern and justified dictatorial means. Um, this is a classic example of the end of my building, uh, which um, incorporated the automobile into the, the performance of consumption, but was then transformed, uh, or the model was then transformed from one of fluidity and circulation to uh, stasis and incarceration as a uh, seat of a secret police and also um, uh, an internal of class um, in speaking of this in Venezuela, also my own work in the same Chile uh, in, in multiple ways. But I'll just leave that there for now. I want to connect this to the, to the works uh, in this room and, and in these rooms. Uh, I'd just like to suggest here that these and other forms of errancy defined as displacement, itineracy, and the creative play with form and structure can be a fruitful way of engaging with the works here. As Miriam writes in her beautiful catalog piece, most of the photographers um, in the show find in uh, Italian nationalism a memory catalyst, precisely because it reassembles and maybe reassembles, but not, but does not quite match German nationalism. These photographers' projects both highlight the connections or legacies of different iterations of nationalism, both in the uh, structural but also in the everyday concept. But they also defamiliarize and therefore illuminate the mismatch between these different authoritarian architectural and aesthetic projects. The photographic practice rehearses a generative errancy of the kind that Gavada proposes and offers an opportunity to recall or rethink some of the core assumptions and legacies of uh, fascist architecture. I'm going to point to two, two uh, examples, the one behind us here on the wall, Hans Christian Chance. Exploration of an aqueduct on bicycle and on foot transforms itinerancy into a narrative tool. Uh, it's yet another reappropriation of the meaning and symbolism of history, but it's a rehearsal that constructs or reconstructs a sense of singularity, uh, a sort of narrative cohesion, even as it locates its symbolism not in some sort of universal abstract, but in the day to day appropriations of everyday peoples. I'm thinking here in particular of uh, graffiti as a sort of transformative ephemeral practice which interrupts the presumptions of a unified gaze or narrative. In a very different way, Eiko's uh, collection of images uh, suggests a more subtle errancy and that the recollection that also draws a narrative at, at art uh, continuity uh, that traces uh, the legacies of fascism across Italy, and I think crucially into uh, the colonies in Eritrea, yet the inclusion of incongruent elements in these collections, a city plan, a postcard, an architectural image reproduced in a book, a skater who is implied movement disrupts the illusion of stasis and isolation and absence, the isolated use of color photography and double photographs that interrupt the left to right movement of the spectator's gaze that Miriam himself suggests. These highlight and disrupt our assumptions uh, that rationalism or uh, fascism might have a singular, transparent, or static meaning, and also the assumption that the photographer can be an unobtrusive observer rather than a creative ethnic involved in the reimagining of history, meaning, and legacies of fascism, of fascist architecture in successive presents. Um, the colonies, as I would suggest, might be a playground for uh, these uh, uh, architects 
but this act of recollection built from a radical, <coughs> destabilizing, contestatory heresy allows for those on the margins to speak back, even if, in some cases, in the very languages and the, and the legacies that that are left from uh, these, uh, this, uh, these pasts. But to speak back, I think, in productive, and these, in this case, fascinating. Yeah. 
does it only show up in series? Do you feel like it's captured in one particular image? Of course. Yeah. It's both. No? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it's, for me, it's all, sorry, it's difficult because my English isn't that good to, um, to talk about things I have in my mind. <laughs> but um, it's just that this, uh, uh, this uh, Tammany, this, uh, this whole group of work, it's a decision. Right? It's a decision to make peace. Some images very big, and other images are all in the same line. And it's just the concept of the presentation, and I don't give it up after. I, perhaps I would do it different after 10 years. I can do it different in the book, but everybody's image has the same size. But uh, I think it's interesting while we are sitting here, for example, when we are talking about this dot, the right corner of the, it's positive and you have the same dot in the first uh, completely negative. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, well and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well I think what, what I'm hearing a little bit throughout and as I'm as I'm catching my, my mental breath a little bit, I think a lot of the the, the questions around this exhibition and the things that you raised to do with the translatability of a the, the, the visual language of these images and the reading of, of architecture and how architecture built during the fascist era is being presented here to us, to an American, mostly American audience. How do we deal with this? And if this if this event happened in Germany or in Italy or elsewhere, it would be a very different kind of conversation. But here we find ourselves talking about these images, and I, I'm sometimes not sure, and I'm very curious to hear from the audience also how you, how you understood what was presented, especially by the artists, because there are certain assumptions that I think we bring with us as raised in a certain cultural context of understanding of what we know or what we should know or what we should be familiar with or what is completely normal to understand and know or what not. So I don't know if if more explanation would have to happen or but but at the same time I'm also thinking that concepts like this the marginal thinking outside of the cultural uh, the comfortable cultural environment that th these images were created by being exhibited here, I think we are opening up the discussion for something that invites the perspective from outside, the traveler's perspective, the, per the, the perspective of somebody, the, the unfamiliar, uh, and things like that. So I would like to talk a little bit about that. And maybe I hope you can talk a little bit about New York, because I have talked to a bunch of people visiting the exhibition, and it is, it is challenging. I mean, in, in a beautiful and, and a great way to, to study your work because it is that there's so much information and there's so much thought that goes into it. And by talking to you, I know that you have a there's a whole system that you have uh, that that drives your your activities and, it, and it's an ongoing project. So can you tell us a little bit more about your thinking and your 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 approach? You first of all, I would refer to John. Uh -oh. I like that you referenced to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really a long term project with so many measures. Okay? And I made the work first in 2013. And uh, it's those raw pieces here I made last year. I can put them in And um, my direct approach, I would say, is um, connected to street photography in a way. Um, it's not connected to architecture, architectural photography. Um, it's not trying to clean the image. It's not trying to, I'm not trying to black out the context, the surroundings, the stuff. I want to 
kill them and to make for a dance. And this approach brought up to the to the large scale here of 150 photographs. I tried to make the same processing. But I had uh, some some ideas in the order. So it's the model that I told before is like a chronological uh, order. It's a, it's a time and uh, space travel. And there are some connections between the images, the neighborhood images, um, in questions of <coughs> style, function of the buildings. There's just one sheet on uh, traffic. Um, and one sheet on early uh, modernism. And maybe there's some connection to literature or to narration. So I want people to read it. And you can start from the actual line, you can start from the middle, and you can say someone to the middle.
symbolic meaning and uh, in this detachment you can put a lot of stuff in, you know. So it's either the first, um, you know, layer is the Italian, Italianity, then there is the Germanity, looking at it and then from here in. Because you have the buildings of the spirit, but they, um, they have a total different um, context for you. So you look at it from that context. And probably that's what helped me looking at them um, when I did the date, you know, because I use this kind of, this architectural period building in my US experience. And they had no political meaning attached to them. Hey, so. I thought that the architecture in that time was in a way local. No? So uh, Italian architects built in Italy, German architects built in Germany, and now every architect like uh, Schipperfield is building in Berlin, in England, in America, or here we have it's a label like Nike or Adidas. Yeah. As an architect, you were totally different. I'm, I'm looking into the future and I'm thinking about what could, of course we have fascist regimes right now, but what is the architecture looking like and is it, is it a global language or is it a local language that, that I'm thinking about right mm -hmm. now? But there is this really deep tension between the local and uh, the international ones at that time period. The modern, and so um, I mean, what's interesting to me about um, the the Italian rationalist architecture in a, as a modern idiom of a contemporary style is that it's taking one universal language, the classic, and replacing it with another universal language, the modern, and that's what, therein you can see a continuity. So it is deeply local, but it is also this aspirant uh, global uh, language, and and so to me that's. That slippage is what's really interesting, that, that even within this kind of universality, people want it connected to place, you know, find ways to localize it. But then within that, that's why we can even have a conversation. Like there's something about it that we recognize in our own modernity, in our own modern architectures. And, we, and to me, it makes me question, like, what, where is the moment that our so-called American or democratic architectures start to become something else? What, what are the, what are the elements of it that allow for it to be iconographical, but to be, um, you know, for example, when, when Trump says, you know, um, we don't want to eliminate our history. When he's talking about not tearing down Confederate statues, right? I mean, like, who is the hour that he's talking about? And what elements of that is, is encompassing? So, so, I mean, like, the, the question of local and universal or global, I think is a really, to me, in this context, really deep question. Uh, because I would say that um, the local can only be read by certain types of subjects with a particular relationship to it. And, and on top of that is this like weird postmodernist history of like taking Italian rationalist architectural theory like Rossi out of context and Americanizing it like purposefully misreading so that it fits our context a little bit better than, than the previous context. So like with the histories of misreadings and the, the, the um, idea that modernity is supposed to be this kind of shared language and shared project. You know, I, I wonder um, if the questions that we have between local and global weren't already sitting at that time period and, and I think we're only not realizing this and that, and that the work here helps us to really reflect on it in a deeper way in, in a sense of, um, you know, it, it's never not local, it's never not global, but, but what are the modalities that we're struggling with at this point and why, what is it about our context allows us to see that element of it now that could be seen in the 1920s, 30s, and the mm -hmm. And that brings me, before we open up the discussion to the audience, one, one key question for me is, since we are in a, in a photography exhibition and video exhibition, um, what does it, what happens when this iconic kind of architecture, this monumental, uh, universal kind of style, visual language is being captured in photographs like these, in sometimes enormous photographs, sometimes in, in 
marvelous quality and beautiful colors. Um, what happens? Is, is, can you photograph this kind of architecture without having to, um, to be accused of being, uh, to, to, to beautify it, to neutralize it, to make it, to make it just an aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing object? Can, can people understand or can people read the criticality behind the attitude or the approach of the obvious criticality in these images, or do we always have to give them, give the viewer something to to, to read it, to understand it? Which is frankly something that I've been wrestling with because, okay, we are in the university museum context, which I think is great because it, it helps us think about this material not only uh, as material for a general audience, but for students mm -hmm. and for school children and for you know all kinds of people who come here, uh, also for educational purposes. So we introduced the timeline and the map and, and thought, okay, this might help to at least locate and understand some of the connections between architecture, the political, and propaganda, and, and, and yeah. Um, so, is this okay? Is this enough? Or do we would we need more to to satisfy this? Or you know what, what is there to do? I mean I, I maybe yeah that's interesting that you you speak to that because maybe that's one of the, the points I was maybe trying to imply to the European sensibility. <laughs> that I, I I would care I mean I would not characterize any of the strategies in the show as as being heroic. I think I think it's pretty. Uh, the approach is the anti-heroic to me in, in the sense that um, it emphasizes the camera's indifference. I, I think that the types of decisions that are made in terms of even lighting, uh, vantage point. I mean, for me, it's 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 a very it's a very dry aesthetic. Whereas here, I think um, you know the Schmaltz dial uh, tends to be uh, turned up. Uh, as Fault or sat colors are saturated, or you know the medium is exploited for its purely aesthetic purposes, maybe in a more ostentatious way. But I, I think part of what for me makes this work, I don't want to say neutralizes it, but um, distances you know it from its context, its original context. I, mean, I think that that's also happening. The way in which the images are presented to the subject. Um, because because they exist in the photographic container in the ways that they do, uh, kind of pulls away from the original context. It's another, another thing I can think about. But but really, that the decisions are, are pretty they're dead in there. I mean, it's the Charlotte Cotton American critic likes to uh, say, actually she's Australian, the U.S. But um, yeah, that this deadpan aesthetic is is very much about uh, a kind of flat. Ontology, in a way, it, for me, anyway. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I hear Camilo nodding and shaking. Yeah, I was interested in the sort of metaphors that were used to, to describe this in particular, your invocation of the palimpsestic. What was interesting for me, because that obviously speaks to history, which is over time, but also flattens and, and challenges as a linear. Uh, history of the rehearsals and the returns that are so surprising us the positions. So I was wondering what you would so how does the, how does your how does your palimpsest intersect with the narrative regulation, which I think you 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 suggest like a reading of these things, which might might not be necessarily linear, but is a reading is about a sort of like a narration unfolding. To me, very different to those spatial and temporal And I'm surprised that you say, at which point does American architecture become something? Because it seems to me that you're suggesting that it always has been, right? And it continues to be. So even in transformation, there's, there's a challenge to the kind of fine, finite uh, periodization that we seem to want. Like, what is fascism? When is fascism? When is it any? The Latin American cases suggest that. That one of the things that that thinking about palimpsest and narrative narration together, in tension with each other, forces us to question democracy, perspective, leadership, 
or causal connection. First, there was this, and this, and others. There's ways in which these things coexist. The legacies of authoritarianism persist, and being translated and interpreted. And it's a fallacy and a dangerous one to, to, to turn to the architecture of photography to delimit these things as some of our hard and fast uh, distinctions or separations. The fascinating thing to me about this is that your question is to, to ask those questions. But the way in which we answer them is a distance of the power says in the region, how do they how do they make yourself? Well, I mean for me like um, this question is a completely postmodern question. <laughs> I mean like yeah, um, this idea of narration versus how says like these terms are both this notion that you know architecture history is a text, you read it as you like, and so the palm test already has the elements of the narrator. There you just draw a line, right? And to me like the an illustration of that is is your piece where we go from the metropole to the home, you know, all in one thing. And we can see the same modernist techniques in one and in the other. Uh, and so they're a connected place. But in our mind, we constructed a fiction that they're separate. That you know, one is the place for the primitive, the other is a place for the moderns, right? And that this is a this is a fiction that we tell ourselves that is part and parcel of nature. Really. And so um, I, I would to answer your question in a contemporary way, I would, I would point to someone like uh, Amy Kapp and her book. Um, uh, the Anarchy of uh, Empire, where she talks about the fact that uh, all empires, including the American Empire, needs both to be, to make itself. Like, it needs the, the narrative that, you know, this is a kind of Western Christian nation, manifest destiny, and we're moving from one coast to another, but then, um, you know, it also partakes in its knowledge of colonialism with, uh, you know, the annexation of space like Hawaii, Kurdish, and others. And so, it's simultaneous, and, and to me, that's what's so great about the show. Like, like, fortunately, um, I don't have to choose. <laughs> I, I, I can look at narration, you know, like, like some uh, things stitch a particular narrative, but then I understand this, it's all simultaneous. And to me, that's what, like, that's what I like about the show. Like, the fact that it gives me both. Whereas if we looked at, you know, zoomed into one, we might not get that part. Anyway, that's a great moment to open up the discussion to the audience. I'm sure there are lots of questions for the artists or presenters in general. There's a question for the video and for our viewers. Um, so with your photos of the clock, so obviously it's, uh, it's time, and you're talking about the uh, time and temporality of photography as a medium. So I was uh, thinking, like how, what would you think, because uh, obviously it's different, uh, this photo got captured, I don't know when, uh, versus maybe the same building that was captured maybe um, a couple of decades ago. Um, so I was wondering how and what, um, as, a, as the notion of time, that apply to uh, the inter interpretation or definition of the same sort of like facious buildings, uh, like within different time periods. In a specific work or the no, work just in general, I guess. Okay, so I guess that's a question for you. I didn't get the question, but my hands are wet. Can you maybe so it like briefly? Um, they're just, um, I brought it through because uh, the temporality of the medium, but then kind of like thought about um, this notion of time, different time period to apply to different maybe interpretation and maybe de definition of um, facious buildings or architecture, I guess. So, um, so this building is really rotten. Mm -hmm. When you put it close, you can it's falling apart. It's, it's like uh, it's, it's lost <coughs> because I'm looking up to a tower, but the surface is lost already. The shining surface, but it's 
clock. And then you have in the front, you have the clock. So in photography, when you go into photography school, educate, educate, uh, educate of photography, you learn that the clock is all the ball is in uh, 10 to 2 <laughs> or, <laughs> or uh, 10 past 10. <laughs> My clock never has this 10 to 10 or 10. So it's, uh, and here you have 20 to 2. And the shadow, I think it, on this image it's also interesting, it's shadow. And on the right side we have a different time. It's 10, 10 past 1. So, so when, I think it, 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 it's it's um, when you uh, make a picture of the clock, you don't know, yeah, like, like, as I, I try to explain, you don't, you, you're not sure if the clock is running or not. So, what, is, what is still, is the clock still itself or makes the photographs of the clock still? So it's a double interpretation of time or history. <coughs> Uh, uh, it's um, like you look on an image and you get back the question. There's no answer. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it was more interesting when we're talking about Trump Tower, if and when we're talking about um, representation, if I would make the same image or a similar image in that size of the trunk top. For example. And why I can question myself again after ten years, why was it was that attractive for me to make this tower in the Maori yeah. But I, I think because I needed the tower in my work. For the, I needed for my stage, uh, which when I showed the, this the Kiriko painting at the beginning, you have uh, the stage and it's, uh, you have different elements which are already post modern. You know? and so when I was creating the stage with all my photographer, photographs, I needed the tower and the, the, the tower I took for the stage. Well, maybe the question can't be completely answered, but I think you get, you get a little bit out of that. Yes. You got a little bit of the latest in this show. When you first made this fashion from Italy in the series, and then the king's photographers taking pictures of this layer, but today, or in the 70s, or in the 80s. So, in the front was maybe the first one to go there in the 80s. And he found those places in the state of decay. And then Heidstrecker came and took maybe the photograph of the same spot, but 20 years later in digital, and she put it in black and white and in color, the same image. So, okay, we have the, the real today contemporary moment in color, and the one who said, okay, this is history. We actually explain, okay, it's the first and the second, and the last one is. And then I would go to this specific um, fish market in Naples, um, which uh, was a shop in, in the night. No, 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 no. 2004. Yeah. I didn't know this before. Mm -hmm. so, um, and we are now by a year ago. And I went there 15 years later. So it was already in the system, so it was not working anymore. So it was not a fish market, it was just a room. So you have so many different historical layers and approaches and different uh, techniques of charging. This is, I don't know, in your back is a classical 4x5 analog approach. And you get, yeah, you know what I mean. But, but I think it's important that you know something 
it's not too much uh, asked for to, to have knowledge. To, you need knowledge to understand art and architecture and design and everything. I think uh, it's not, uh, for me, it's, um, uh, uh, I think you, have a, you need an understanding of literature of, of everything to understand it. It's not, uh, it's not a one It's not, uh, uh, I don't want to excuse myself. Even. It's, not a, it's not a fault. It's not a fault. Yeah. Also talking about beauty, I can ask what, what is beauty? What is beautiful about this uh, rotten stairway in black and white? What is beautiful about that? But I like it, but I can't understand people say I, the size is pretty perhaps, yeah, I don't know, but um, also this uh, I think the the, um, the main thing of for example, uh, the house of Durrani is uh, the, the industrial, uh, how it's done. It's really attractive. Mm -hmm. How transparent it is, how uh, fragile, how uh, small. small. It's really attractive itself. Mm -hmm. I like an iPhone today, perhaps, or anything else. It's, uh, how it's done, mm -hmm. how they manage it. Also, the, uh, I think fascism uh, is attract attractive because you have to space it, spaces and you ask yourself, why is it mentioned for? It's a question of mention. What, what shall happen here? What shall, it's always mentioned for... Uh, for uh, I mean, created for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. created for... Uh, something like an opera for a lot of soldiers, for a lot of people. It's like a, a scenario, it's, it's a scene. And, uh, do you want to sing something? Yeah. Well, is there anybody else here who would like to ask a question? Okay. Yes. Omar, go ahead. So I'm, I'm sort of interested in the uh, the question of a close-up when we deal with architecture. Because so much, I think, of the problem of photographing architecture uh, goes to the problem of this representing architecture that you can't ever get the full view of architecture. And I, in most of these, especially here, where, where we are now, we all have been talking about time, I'm really more interested also in the frame and whether this close-up in most of these cases is also a form of distancing because we don't see the full architecture. But also, the maybe on another level, there's a question of how much now we have in terms of photography and imagery of architecture that would be part of the globalization of imagery. So I know uh, about buildings that I will never visit because of Google, and I can sort of grab all of that. Uh, and that is, uh, a distancing which is now made familiar. So I'm sort of interested in the, the close-up, which seems to be about getting very close to something, seeing something as a form of distancing, which seems to be what, or, or dead panning, as I think was called, versus the other action, which is the really of trying to get so much imagery to see everything, um, to, but still distancing. Uh, just these are two different actions I see as a kind of framing problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think one is, I mean, one thing you're talking about is, is all about context of so pulling back uh, and then getting closer. You're, you're saying distancing. I, I mean, I would, I would add uh, maybe almost uh, a way to also transcend the subject 
too. I mean, I think in the case of findings work, uh, you know, getting closer is actually revealing uh, these kind of nevertheless conditions of, of everything in the world. So for me, we're getting closer is, is kind of elevating it and, and expanding the context and into maybe more cosmic, uh, deeper time kind of space. Uh, I, mean, I, I have to think about, I think what you said is really interesting. I, I have to think of more about that. But um, I, have, I have two ideas because this is cool. Uh, I think um, that. Uh, um, you, have this, you have this sense, kind of senses, and as I always say, when, like when I'm going close up, I, I start to smell it. Yeah, but when you, when you go close to something, I, uh, you, you, you start to um, don't smell anything, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a trick to uh, make that's another sense interesting. So it's totally open uh, different uh, strategy like documentation. This is neutral, this smells nothing, it's objective, it's uh, even the sun is not shining, and everything is grey, it's totally neutral. So it's, it's, it's very in, in, intimate. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is there was a big show in Vienna, Reugel. And uh, they worked together with, uh, with uh, Getty. And they made green, because you have, uh, you have an image of this size, and you have about 200 people <laughs> doing everything in this image. And it's like two to, I, I don't know exactly the size, but they make a cooperation with Getty and they had a website where you can really go into this image in details uh, and um, it, it was like a puzzle. Right? You have two people playing a game in original of this size and you have a on the monitor. And, um, Perhaps Google can, when they're working a little bit faster, in 10 years you can even go on details like this. Mm -hmm. and why not? There's also an architectural answer to your question, which is that um, it is like in the panels like this one, I'm thinking of like, you know, like Nice, who would look for the book in, right? Like, that's a detail that tells you how to think about the entire building. So in some ways you're not actually distancing, you're actually getting the kind of abstraction of the rule set that one applies throughout. So you get that one moment, that really is a framing of that one moment, but it, it carries the logic of everything else. And so in that sense, I would feel like it's not really distancing, it's sort of like it's editing. It's editing out all the other stuff that might distract you, and so you can just focus on that. And um, if you read it in a particular way, it continues this notion of, you know, the Renaissance notion that you can move from the detail to the whole building, and there's kind of continuity and architecture that, that does that. But then there's also like, there's a, in some images there's an uncanny element. Like you could find a kind of materiality in something that a, a drawing for you think you would think was just monolithic. And I'm thinking, for example, like certain images of the Casa del Fascio, you actually see the camera. And like the fact that they couldn't keep up the care for it, and you could see the seams, you know, it kind of breaks down the, the um, the fiction of this thing being a perfect block, right? Like it's not a block of cheese that you cut things out of, right? But you assembled it out of stuff. And so now you're looking at this thing and looking for the, the errors, like the, the seams, the problems. Um, and that could, that could add another layer. Um, but I don't know if I call it distancing. It's sort of like, it's like um, giving you a kind of um, tactile, visceral understanding of something that's abstract. And that's what I really like about that like close up. Like you're, Nose pressed to the thing, it, it brings you greater knowledge in both the abstraction but in the, the detail. Um, but I don't know if that reading is like too like documentary or whatever. But, but I think this image has no moment anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no moment anymore because what, there's no opposite understanding. It's 
daytime or evening or morning. I don't, I'm not on the street uh, in, in the winter or in the summer. Mm -hmm. It's like a scan. Mm -hmm. There's no. Yeah, there's but, but to me, that's what makes it operate like a draw. Yeah. Like, like the fact that what the architect draws is this thing that, like, when someone makes a line drawing of Casa de Fascia, it's not at noon per se. It just, it just is. It's like this kind of autonomous existing thing that gives the rule set for how long we use that. But that's a that's like a metonymic logic, right? The, the, the part that stands in for the whole the part that. But that is it's a, it's a metaphor, it's a fiction, it's a, it's a it's an analogy that's being drawn. And what I like about a lot of these images, but particularly the Michigan piece, is is that it both highlights that the, the, the fictionality of that, right? Here we have a piece that, that is of a whole, and yet by by its closeness, it, you're continuously disrupting that the, the, the logic there. There's one of them where there's a model of is it parking lot? No, of no, course here. Yeah, I can't say thank you. And then here all of a sudden we have both the fiction of coherence, right, in miniature, and the fiction of of, of fracturing of in front of me. So I so instead of doing you know, your organ, <laughs> this is about highlighting the constructiveness of um, these overlapping or processing languages. But then using that logic, I would say that like, the images that are successful with that, yeah. they're not in this part. Yeah. Like, you don't have the rule set, the geometrical rule set that tells you what it is that makes it a building. So then it becomes something else. It either dematerializes something else, it becomes part of a larger set. Um, like Maybe at the urban level it's still architecture, but it's activated by other things, but like when you don't have that geometry, we don't have that kind of cardinal rule set, at least for the, the classical and the modern, then um, it's, I would start that's not architecture. <laughs> so you're not photographing architecture now. Now you're photographing something else. You're photographing a moment in time. You're photographing uh, an atmosphere. You're photographing like something, some intimacy that, that cannot be captured in the abstract. So, which is why this one, it's interesting to me because it literally is half a drawing. Like, <laughs> you know, it's half a drawing of a pattern, right? Because it, yeah. I know how it should be filled in. Like, like there's there's a return to this kind of cardinal uh, underlay that keeps it architecture. Okay. Whereas in some of these, maybe I can argue that. All right. Okay. We have we are over time already, but there was one last question. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, all of you.